Perfect. Who better than Derek, Pat, Andrew, the wrestling crew? Man, they bout to put an end to y'all careers like a finishing move. They bout to give y'all facts on these cats that's fighting on these mats. Y'all can't see them like John Cena. Even if y'all had 2020 vision, y'all better listen. Pay attention and take notes down and realize that it's not your time now. And watch these three kings take the crown. Hey, hey. Hey guys, this is Eric Viking from Pro Wrestling Explosion, also known as PWE, and you are listening to Wrestling IQ 101 podcast, which is the best podcast of all time. Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of Wrestling IQ 101. I'm Andrew, alongside, alongside Pat and Derek. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Wrestling IQ 101, and subscribe and like the video. And today we're sitting with a former ECW tag team champion, former WWE superstar, Tony Mama Luke. How's everything going, brother? Oh, I'm doing great. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. Nice. Yeah, anytime. So, Tony, what have you been up to since breaking away from the professional wrestling business? Um, I've been a, a peace officer in the city of New York in a section of the area called the Bronx. Uh, and basically what I do is I, uh, I bring a cadet along to the academy with physical fitness training and uh, education and, well, New York State law and so on. But uh, I've been, that takes up most of my time. Occasionally I venture out to your autograph show here and there. Oh, I think we saw you the last time at the big event. Oh yeah, in, New, uh, York. New York, yeah. with Nunzio. <laughs> was that was that the Queens event? Yeah, I think it was, yeah, okay. that was the last one I did. Yeah. So, have you thought about maybe like doing commentary or being a manager, or is that just something that maybe you don't want to do at the moment? Um. I think that I would, I'm not really a on-screen type of guy. I never even was when I was on television. I, I never wrestled for the sake of becoming a television star. Um, so to answer your question, I, I would really, if anything, if I had anything to do with the business, it would be in a mentoring type of teaching type of way. Because uh, that's what I've always enjoyed is the, the psychology of telling a story in the ring. And... I had a guy that was over as a as a character, so I didn't need to be the star of the tag team, and that was that was just fine with me. So, if anything, I'd rather be a, a behind the scenes personality. So, talking about your training a little bit, you got trained by Dean Malenko. Do you think that your training by him opened the door for you to get into WCW? Well, I don't think that I. I know that to be the case because when I when I broke into pro wrestling, uh, well, first of all, the the reason I went to the Malenko school is because, frankly and simply, I was a Malenko fan. Uh, I think I think it is actually on record that Tony Mamaluke is the biggest Team Malenko fan that there ever has been. So <laughs> that's why I, <laughs> that's why I moved my entire life to Florida when I was 19 years old to become a pro wrestler. Just really. More than anything else, because I wanted to meet Dean Malenko. I was a mark. <laughs> and uh, at, at the core of everything, I was 120 pounds, so making it in the wrestling business was never really wow. something I ever entertained. Uh, and uh, to, the fact that I even got on shows was, the, and this happened to me countless times, people would look at me, and, and I look like... I look like someone who jumped the rail and got in the back of the, in the locker room by accident. But when I told him I was trained by Dean Malenko, it gave me a lot more credibility and I ended up getting on a lot more shows than I probably had any business being on. So getting into WCW had everything to do with having a, a combination of uh, getting the rub off of uh, Diamond Dallas Page and Chris Canyon and certainly the, the, the connection to Malenko. And, you know, and his friends in, in the office. And that was like your debut is sort of in that role with jumping the rail and playing that character. Yeah, well, it was believable. <laughs> Dusty Rhodes actually came up with that idea. He was my, just if you can imagine that I went from wrestling my first show for free uh, when I was just 
turned 20 years old to a year and a half later having my own personal booker beat D- Dusty Rhodes uh, for WCW is just, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it just, just never made any sense to me, but that's really what happened. In 18 months, I went from wrestling at a place called Kahuna's Bar and Grill in Tampa, Florida, which was, uh, in effect, an outdoor beach volleyball court. Uh, where a ring should never have been, but that's where my first match was. And to, to wrestling, uh, you know, for world championship wrestling, which happened to be my favorite promotion. So, I mean, it was just ridiculous. It was like a, it, it, as I've often said, when someone brings up Tony Mamaluke in his career, because I, I look at him differently than myself, uh, I forced Gump my way through things. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. So... So, uh, with Dean Malenko, did he teach you all 1,001 of his holds? Well, uh, probably more than that. Oh, what, was neat about, <laughs> what, was neat about, <laughs> what was neat about Dean Malenko is, is he's actually forgot, forgotten more wrestling than anybody probably will ever remember or know. And he would be training us in the ring. Uh, and then he would remember something that he had done from... 10, 15 years earlier, and then he would teach us that and try it out on television again. So you could actually be taught the technique and the move, and then he would say, oh, yeah, well, let me use this on TV, and then there you have it. Now you can have it as practical application of the, of the maneuver, which was you know, just, it was the ultimate, like, Tony Mamaluke, like, marking out moment. <laughs> Every time I got to hang out with Dean Malenko in the ring, it was like I learned so much that I couldn't believe it. He was just so great at teaching and still to this day is probably the best teacher that's not running a school in the country. It's a shame he isn't, but he's too busy. But what an amazingly gifted, talented trainer. Nice. Now, can you, can you tell us kind of like how was the process of you getting into WCW and like how were your experiences there as well? Okay, uh, the, the process of getting in, again, like I told you before, I forced Gump my way through it. And what happened is Eric Bischoff had come up with this concept that he was trying to develop where he wanted to have a, a hybrid show of pro wrestling meets uh, the Power Rangers back when that was popular in the late 90s. And it, what he had did was he wanted to, what he wanted to do was hire a bunch of smaller cruiserweights uh, and have them be in these over-the-top costumes and have we were going to have our own separate show and that's when you uh, were introduced to the guys like Shane Helms and and uh, and those types of guys from Tennessee um, from uh, from Burt Prentice's territory and what happened is AJ Styles was picked to be in that in that group, but he turned down the offer, and that offer came fell into my lap when I showed up on somebody else's highlight reel. And that friend that that was a friend of mine named Jeremy Lopez, who I had actually who was actually my first match. It all goes around in one place, one circle. He uh, sent this tape in because Dean had told him about it about their show they were trying to put together, and he he sent it to Chris Canyon, and Canyon saw me on his highlight tape on Jeremy's highlight tape and wanted to get a hold of me and the rest kind of fell into place with Diamond Dallas Page and Chris Canyon and then we had our trial match and and, uh, and, and they hired us <laughs> so it was kind of it, it, it also that was when Jamie Noble got his first break we all had our same trial match and the funny thing about that is they put us on a trial match for a pay-per-view and they brought us in. They paid us $500, which was more money than I'd made in the entire time I was an indie wrestler in one night in Florida, which if you've ever wrestled in Florida, you know that making anything more than 50 bucks is a good payday. <laughs> and, uh, and that's including to this day and age market, but they forgot to watch the match. Uh, and it was, it, it wasn't that good of a match because we were all so nervous and we, you know, we wanted to have the perfect match and nobody saw it. And they said, well, you know, unfortunately, we didn't watch the match, but if you want to come to Nitro the next night and wrestle, we're not going to pay you, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll at least watch it. 
And we all laughed at ourselves thinking, you know, I, you know, the day before my WCW trial match, I was in a ladder match for a guy named Bill, uh, Bill, Bill Weaver. And I fell off the ladder about 25 feet and should have died. <laughs> oh, and I made $15. <laughs> $15. <laughs> You're going to tell me I'm going to go wrestle in Nitro for a chance at a job for free? Yeah. Buddy, where do I sign up? <laughs> uh, so to get in now with the thing that you, you, the second part of your question, about my feelings about WCW, I, I, and I mean this sincerely and honestly, it was the worst experience of my wrestling career. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, man. Okay. You know, I was married, I've, I've been married, I've been divorced, I know dysfunction, uh, I understand that, and uh, it was the most dysfunctional, backwards run organization which the word organization shouldn't be used. It was it was, it was a disaster. I was there when when I got there, Eric Bischoff was in charge. And then Eric Bischoff gets fired. And then Kevin Sullivan is in charge. And then Kevin Sullivan gets replaced. And then and during this whole period, Dusty Rhodes is, is my personal booker, which, again, uh, unto itself is surreal. And... Mm-hmm. We're running this whole angle, like you said, where I jumped the guardrail, and the purpose of that was to become, I was Lodi's biggest fan, which was me and probably his mom, and I competed with her, and I beat her on that level. And, you know, God bless. A nice guy, and a solid, you know, hand. Nothing against his talent, but why would anyone want to be his fan? I mean, for, you know, I don't know, but sure enough, here I am as a fan, sure. So what you know, the, the idea was I was this obsessed fan, and the progression was I went from going to all the shows and wanting to see uh, Lodi and touch Lodi, and then when Lodi besmirched me, then I jumped in the ring, and I was going to get my, you know, two seconds of hanging out with my hero, and then, you know, so what happened is we were in North Carolina, and uh, we had progressed to the point where I'm going to jump the guardrail. So cool. So now we're going to take it to the next level. So the spot comes and I jump the rail. And what happened is we planned it out with the security staff at, at that at the building, which was the Dean Dome in North Carolina. And the, the concept was is they were going to do the old uh, chase me around. And then I was going to duck and dive and crawl through the legs and run out the back door and, and get away. Well, time comes, bell rings, match starts, or is about to start. I jump the guardrail, I get to the ring, I go to Lodi, here comes security, they start chasing me around. And we do the whole spot where I run and end up and I crawl underneath the legs and I'm running up the, st- up the aisle. When I get up, running up the aisle, I see a wall of security and I don't know why because they weren't part of the original plan. But I said, okay, maybe they're just filled with, you know, whatever. So I juke left, I run right, I duck my head in this security guard came and nailed me right in the face with me and broke my nose. Oh, man. <laughs> now they pick me up in the air. I don't know what's going on. I am completely, my eyes are swollen. I'm tearing up. I, I'm upside down. I'm being assaulted by the security guard. <laughs> and the two guys that were in on it go, no, no, let him go. So now I can't see. And I don't know where I'm going, but I know I need to run, but I'm not sure where. And if you ever, you know, if you have enough time in your, to find this video, which might take you a while, it was this nitro. I'm running up this hill and I'm passing Stephen Regal and Dave Taylor and I'm going as slow as humanly possible and I can't see. And this giant, because the Dean Dome was kind of subterranean and I'm running up this hill and it's like the slowest Keystone cop chase ever, and I don't know where I'm going. I just know I need to run. And David Taylor and, and Regal are looking at me like, "What the hell is going on? And why is this happening?" <laughs> it was the worst. So the next week, Kevin Sullivan was removed, and now Kevin Nash is in charge, and De- and and Dusty Rhodes is trying to pitch this angle to Kevin Nash, and Kevin Nash killed it right there. And uh, and that was the end of my first. My first big run with WCW, and I, I say that tongue in cheek, of course, but <laughs> it just it just it just quantifies. Not to mention the time that I saw uh, one of the Nasty Boys, and I won't identify which one, but I'm sure you can 
figured out by now who decided that he would love to show Sid Vicious his genitals in the middle of the locker room. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh. <laughs> that wow. was an, uh, what is the best part of that was when Sid turned to me. He didn't, I didn't know Sid Vicious from, from Adam. He turned to me and he said, that is the stupidest son of a bitch I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you gotta understand, I'm 21 years old, I don't, or 22 rather, I don't know what the hell, this is like, I went from watching this stuff to being a part of it, and I'm like, where, what in the hell is going on in my life? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. Yeah, you're like the circus. Uh, so that, that just kind of so, 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 uh, gives you an insight into that, 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 mind you, this is before the Vince Russo era. Uh, but whatever <laughs> I can go on for days were, were you watching ECW at the time or WWE uh, uh, I was uh, I was an ECW fan <laughs> I was a total ECW fan uh, when I first found ECW it was on the 4 o'clock in the morning spot which would be I guess Sunday morning and Saturday into Sunday morning so I would I would stay up you know, you gotta, you gotta understand, like, I was a teenager, I didn't have any plans, I wasn't gonna go to college, I was a small town kid, my dad never went to college, we, I didn't have any plans, I was just a wrestling fan, and, you know, I wanted to see good wrestling, and I found this alternative ECW thing by way of my uncle, and the first match I ever saw was uh, Raven and Stevie versus the Pitbulls, and I said, I've never seen anything like it, I need to see more. And from there, I discovered Dean Malenko and Eddie Guerrero, and so I became, I was just a fan of the product, and, uh, and WCW, when, when Malenko and Eddie and Benoit went over there, of course, I gravitated to that, you know, I was always into the science of the wrestling, I didn't really care for much of the angles, although the NWO thing was kind of interesting, I guess, but that played itself out, but I was, I was never really a huge WWE fan. Like WWF slash WWE, I like Bret Hart. Uh, I appreciated Shawn Michaels, and when Ric Flair was there, I certainly had my eye on the product because of him and Randy Savage and, and that feud. But I wasn't necessarily a WWE fan. I was by the simple fact that it had the most TV exposure when I was a kid. The, my f most favorite territory of all time was world class with the Von Erics and the, and the, and the Freebirds, that's the stuff. <laughs> that and, and the Road Warriors from Chicago, that's what really kind of turned turn me into a real wrestling fan. So, um, talking about ECW a little bit, you were a part of the last event in the company history. Can you just talk about that, uh, that night a little bit? Are we talking about the last televised event or the actual real last show? Yeah, the the last show. Okay, well that that was an interesting weekend because it was a rare time in that I well in the period that I was in ECW we never had anything which is called a, a bought show before, and they were uh, if I'm not mistaken they were in Missouri. Uh, <laughs> they were the, the two shows that were bought in Missouri and. Uh, I remember, the one thing I remember over the weekend the most was the fact that I wanted to make sure that Joey Mercury and uh, had finally gotten a win over <clears throat> the FBI because they had, him and his partner had laid down for us like every single, every single show. <laughs> and, we, and, I, and I lobbied that they go over at the end. But what was funny about it was when we got to the airport, I was waiting for the airport, and Guido got in, he goes, you know, it's over, don't you know? It's going to close it down. It's over. <laughs> and he was really mad, like, I'm going to do something about it. Like, brother, it's, it's, I'm sorry. I don't, you know, I don't know what to say. I, I know it's upsetting, but, you know, we kind of saw this coming for months, you know? Uh, it sucks, and I'm, and I'm disappointed, but, you know, what can I do? I was 23. Yeah, but he was just really mad, like I was going to be able to, you know, be, like, I think he was upset that I wasn't totally upset. I was too young to even know I should have been, <laughs> you know, I was a wrestling fan. And like you know, for tw two years before that, I was, you know, working at McDonald's, you know, going to wrestling school. So okay. yeah, none of this, I had no way to process any of this. So, you know? <laughs> but the, the, the last weekend in and of itself was, uh, it was sad because, you know, I was 
what I was missing, what I was going to miss was hanging out with my friends. You know, I'd made some really good friends there and uh, who are still my friends today, which is good that we didn't go in 12 different million directions of some of them have passed on. But uh, it was just kind of, it was sad and, and kind of unfortunate that it had to end because I tell you now, if it was still open, I'd still be working there. I would, you know, I loved working for Paul Heyman and Tommy Dream. It was great. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it's unfortunate because I think the business needs that a company like, I guess you have NXT, but it's still under that same umbrella. You can call it whatever you will, but it's still WWE. You need something alternative for the fans to feel like they have something different to turn into. That's what made wrestling so great in the 90s. You had the contrasting styles, but you don't have that now. And that's unfortunate. Yeah. So, how was the um the transition from going from WCW into ECW? Oh my goodness! Well, well, first of all, <laughs> let me tell you why I got fired out of WCW. Yeah. Um, going back to the original plan where I jumped the railing when they broke my nose, the the, the idea was if you guys remember the Yete or Ron yeah. Reese or whatever, yeah. you know, yeah. The Yeti. Well, the Yeti <laughs> was supposed to be my secret weapon to getting my revenge on on being uh, dissed by a Lodi. Yeah. It said him and I, and this actually was the uh, brainchild of uh, Sh- uh, Shane Helms. The concept was I was so small and he was so big, he was going to come in in yet another terrible and ridiculous costume, <laughs> looking somewhere the combination of like the jolly green giant meets like the super ninja from the turtles movies. <laughs> and he was going to bring me to the ring in a bag like a like a like a over the shoulder knapsack <laughs> and I was going to be like you know this little tiny guy that jumps out and kind of like uh, I guess if Enzo Amore was off the gas that would be me <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that was going to be you know this that was Shane Helms' idea. Now, Shane had come up with this concept for me, which is great uh, that he was thinking of someone he had, had never met before, but it might have been, you know, kind of like a, you know, a, a career killer, although I took care of that myself. But nevertheless, <laughs> um, you know, I don't know if that really would have had a long-term main event status type of push up behind it, but whatever. Hey, we would have been on TV. Well, who am I going to judge? But... So that was the original concept. And then what happened is, you know, we were training. My very first day, I went to the power plant. I got in the ring with seven, legitimately seven feet four Ron Reese. And he backdrop suplexed me on the back of my head. And he knocked me completely out. Uh, that was the very first time I ever got in the ring with the guy. Well, I didn't. And this is when everyone was getting fired and the wheels were starting to come off and WCW was going to go down the drain and everyone started seeing the change in the bookers and everything. So there was a lot of people being fired. So I, I was, I said, well, I better get into the power plant. So at least they're making, you know, they can see me. So I got hurt the very first day and then I didn't tell anybody, came back the next day and got knocked out several other times over the course of four or five months to the point where when I finally did get my television break, I was suffering from post-concussion syndrome, but I didn't tell them that either because, you know, I, I came from a different type of, you know, I mean, the people that grew me up in the wrestling business was Luna Vachon and Gangrel, so we didn't go around talking about injuries all that much. So, uh, in it. so what eventually happened is they, they found out about the concussions, they sent me to a specialist, once that specialist cleared me, I got fired. The very next day. Yeah, well, that's what you get for not having any post high school career plans. So, yeah. um, so what happened is over the next nine months, I was unable to sleep right or train or lift weights. And every time I laid down, the room would spin, and I suffered for months and months and months and months and months. And then I got healthy, and it just so happened that. Canyon was very good friends with Sinister Minister, and he came up for a weekend to visit Chris because I was living in Chris's basement with Jeremy, uh, the guy that got me into the wrestling business in the beginning anyway, or at least WCW. Uh, and we were living in his basement, and I was be- I was a bouncer at this nightclub, and 
happenstance, happenstance that ECW was in town for that week. I went over there and met them. And what happened is my WCW time, I would met a guy named Mikey Whipwreck, who I just happened to be a fan of, and I just wanted to say hello. And he remembered that and said, why don't you come to South Carolina tomorrow and have a tryout match? I said, okay. So I went to the tryout match. My very first bump in the ring, Jeremy knocked me out again. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I got up and kept going on with the match and they liked it so what's great is they wanted me to wrestle the same match again for Tommy Dreamer and uh, so very well so we wrestled the match again the very first time I got the, the very first bump of the match boom he knocked me out again he knocked me out twice in the same two hour period oh my goodness <laughs> And uh, and happened, and Guido was in the crowd. He wasn't doing anything uh, particularly. He was kind of uh, doing the three-way dances with Tajiri and Super Crazy and was looking for a new direction. And he said, hey, I want to tag with that guy. <laughs> and that's how I got into the FBI. Were you guys friends off the bat, or did that something that had to be thrown uh, after a while? Oh, no, it was instant. Instant, uh, there was instant chemistry. In fact, I just went, hung out with him and his family last night. We went to a, a soccer match for the Red Bulls and the New York City Football Club, so celebrating his son's 12th birthday. So, oh, yeah, nice. we, we were instantaneously uh, in the ring and, and behind the scenes. We were friends right out of the gate because he just, I'm, I'm the yin to his yang, and it just works out perfectly, you know. I I always enjoyed being the Marty Janetti, and that was totally cool. You know, because <laughs> the funny part about it, again, like I said, I forced up my way through it. The first time I ever saw Guido was on TV when ECW was doing the uh, Invasion show for Monday Night Raw way back what 1996. And I said, if I ever was going to be a wrestler, I want to be just like little Guido. Because I'm, you know, I'm Italian and he's Italian and he's small and I'm small. I related to him and I said, "Well, I'd like to be that guy." And sure enough, I became his tag partner for the next 15 years. <laughs> so I'm related to wrestling. Where's the best pizza in New York? <laughs> um, probably. Uh, you know, there's a place right near where I live, J and V's. That's pretty good, but it, it's so hard because. Um, there's just so many options to say that there's any one that's the best it's really up to what you like if you like it to be crunchy, thin, whatever just what's, what's certainly true is that you can always get something that you are going to like so as far as pizza goes Mike's is pretty good You know, there's always everybody's famous apparently I don't know <laughs> everybody, there's no if there's no non-famous pizza joint in New York City <laughs> So, you know. So, um, you know, the ironic thing is with uh, Whipwreck is y you and uh, Guido ended up beating him and Tajiri for the titles. Can you go into that match a little bit? Talk about it. Well, it, 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 I'm just so great at wrestling uh, <laughs> that, you know, I'm sorry, but I decided to be, I just had to. You know, I had to take it from Tajiri and Mikey, and you know, <laughs> somebody had to hold the other belt, so I'm glad Guido was there so I wouldn't have to do everything. Uh, Tajiri, Mikey, uh, Tajiri, let me just say, Tajiri might be, I have to say, he's the best wrestler I've ever wrestled. And I don't think it's close. Really? He's just, he is absolutely amazing. Um, and Mikey was great because he understood the shortcomings that Tajiri had when it came to, you know, some language and, and, and stylistically when it came to, uh, you know, laying out a match that sometimes didn't always have to be kicking your face off. So they had a great chemistry as a tag team. Um, they were uh, perfect for us as far as the, the perfect tag team that we needed to face to get over and it was at, at, as far as like a tag team scenario I mean if you put us in against a team like the Eliminators back in the earlier 90s or even the Gangsters uh, God forbid Public Enemy 
uh, I don't see how that would have made any sense with my style and Guido's style wouldn't have made a lot of sense. I mean, we would have just, you know, I mean, it just wouldn't have made sense. That team was perfect for us because they didn't make us look any smaller. Uh, they had great, a great move set that was over and all we had to do was bump around and cheat to win. It was the perfect old school, uh, chicken shit type of heel stuff and we would, end up winning in the end, which ultimately draws enough heat to get old school heat. It was great that we could have, uh, and that's how wrestling, as much as we want to talk about how it's changed and, 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 and how the psychology is so different, and nowadays, you know, the fans don't fall for the old school tactics, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I get it. Everybody understands what the deal is, unfortunately. And it's our fault for telling you. But, this, you know, you still read a book the same way. You don't go to the back page and read it and then, and then go to the front page and read it and skip in the middle and say, well, if, you know, and understand the book. That's not how you tell a story. You don't watch a movie, uh, with the finish at the end that you don't, you know, it was logical, old school with new moves. And that's what gets over. And that's why TNA is successful. Yeah. Nice. So, and also, in, uh, when you guys were in ECW, when you used to come out, you guys used to have your uh, weight uh, announced in uh, liquid ounces. Can you kind of tell us, like, how you guys came up with that idea? That was totally my idea. <laughs> I can actually say that, honestly, that really was my idea. I oh, was nice. doing that back when I was, uh, when I was in, uh, on the indies. Because who's going to really want to wash a guy that says he's weighing 120 pounds? So, in effect... I weigh less than your teenage daughter, so <laughs> no one, no one's. I mean, you're paying a ticket to watch some kid who just apparently didn't have anything to do tonight coming out there and wrestle in front of you. That you know, okay. So I just said, you know, you got to kind of, you got to kind of not take yourself too seriously here. So I, I, I just calculated what I weighed in liquid ounces, or and translated it to ounces, and said, well, liquid ounces sounds funny, and then that's when I went with it, <laughs> and then. I just uh, somehow convinced Guido that, you know, they're going to take us serious because I am a real pro wrestler, even though I'm coming out to how many of them are You know, but uh, that was all my creation. I still do that. Well, when I did wrestle, I did that my entire career. <laughs> so, when you got to TNA, you were having, you were one of the pioneers that built the exhibition. Did you feel like you were building something special? I didn't build anything. I was there for a payday. Uh, the guy that built that, that was AJ Styles. That was, uh, like Jerry the Lynn. Green. There was Jerry Lynn, of course. That was, uh, of course it was, uh, low key. Those are the guys who built it in red. My style was, you know, my style was not what, I, this tells you why I knew I wasn't in the right place. Bob Ryder, who is, uh, a nice guy. But he's a travel agent. He is a guy that books airplane tickets. And I wrestled a match that told a story, uh, emphasized technique, uh, had a purpose to why we did the moves. And he said that you weren't flying around enough. I said, well, if I fly around and do a bunch of moves that don't mean anything, then why would I fly around? So in other words, if I go into the forest with a firearm that shoots 50 caliber per second, and I miss everything. So all I got is a big gun and I can't do anything with it. So all these moves that don't mean anything, the reason they don't get over it, why all these kids are trying to get over, they're not getting over, their moves are getting over. Well, that's not how I was trained. That's not how I wrestled. So the, the fans are, pop, they're not cheering you. They're not cheering you. They're cheering the move. You are just happy to be the one that does it. And that's why no one gets over uh, unless they have a backstory, unless they have moves that make sense at the right time and unless they use the detect the move at the right time and uh, I, I was trained to incorporate psychology from almost before I even ran the ropes and that's how I always will wrestle or always did wrestle is that everything I did every move that I made in the ring every step that I took had a purpose and uh, and that's what I was taught, and that's why it didn't translate necessarily very well at the earlier stages of TNA, because they were looking to be 
in effect, Crash TV. They wanted to be ECW, but they weren't. And what they were was TNA. And then they figured that out, and then they, they, they got on better footing with what they were. So, um, piggybacking off the X Division, when you joined the WCW and you saw all the mayhem there, did you see also the potential in joining their cruiserweight division there with all the potential that they had? In WCW? Yeah. Well, you know, Dallas Page said I was going to get the world title. I'm like, really? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I was uh, world title. I was unemployed. <laughs> going to become a world champion. I, I even laughed at that when he said, I laughed at him for saying that. I said, you, you, you realize that uh, I'm just a kid. <laughs> you know, I'm just a kid. I don't know why you think I'm going to win anything, I, you know. But uh, he was convinced that I was going to win the world title because he was going to tell, he was going to, Dallas Page was a huge influence on me. So uh -huh. the, the opportunity, sure. I mean, to be able to wrestle guys like, I don't know, Rey Mysterio and, and, and Juventud Guerrero. I did actually get a chance to wrestle Psychosis and ECW, but I mean, I mean, it was just surreal at the time. I mean, I, uh, it would have been great to get into the ring and wrestle Dean Malenko one time in some capacity, but I mean, I was just so young. I didn't know what was going on. I, all of it was just outrageous. I mean, I, my first night in WCW, I'm, tra I'm changing next to Ric Flair and he's talking about like what he's going to do when he gets home tonight. I'm like, what are we talking? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> now, when I mean, you, it, you know, it's just a weird time in my life. <laughs> now, when you were on the uh, the Independence, uh, you went to uh, Ring of Honor, and there you went from being Lil Guido's partner to actually having a feud with him. Can you kind of tell us about that experience as well? Yeah, I mean, we originally went in there to be a tag team, and he got the call to go to... Uh, WWE and it was he was on his way out and he wanted to put he wanted to give me a, a bit of a push to kind of keep my uh, my situation moving forward in Ring of Honor and uh, he did me the favor and uh, uh, it was it was the first time we ever wrestled and um, I didn't I personally I didn't really like doing it because I'd always been his partner so it was a little weird but um it was a short-lived program. I think we were just always better as a tag team, and uh, you know. But he had to do what he had to do, and I'm, I'm glad he had the opportunity. Ring of Honor at the time was, was kind of a unique situation. It was trying to find itself as a company, and they were bringing in all the top indie guys around the country. ECW was out of the way, so they had an opportunity. You know, they became the you know the third company in the United States. Actually, you know, they they've done a wonderful job. Uh, from where they started, I think it was on their fourth show, I think it's about right, or something like that, TNA's fourth show, they might have been running for about six months, uh, they weren't around very long, um, but uh, yeah, it, I would have rather uh, not had the match, but it was just business, we had to do it, so. So, talking about 2006, you finally get the call from WWE and be part of World Night Sand, did you know? Going into it, you have a full-on contract, or it was just a one-off for you? No, I, as far as, well, I did the, uh, what was it, 2005, it was a one-night stand? Yeah. Okay, that, that I knew was a one-off. That was just a payday, uh, courtesy of Tommy Dreamer throwing me a bone. It was kind of cool. I got to meet J.T. Smith for the first time. That was nice. He's a nice guy. Uh, you know, I did my little spot. Guido had his match. So that was that was a one off. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as uh, as far as in two thousand and six, I had a contract signed before that show. So yeah, I was a contract uh, member of the roster, and uh, you know I was excited about it. It was a unique opportunity. I mean, ECW on the on the heels of that DVD and the pay per view off of the off after that, and then the rekindling of the uh, the old company was kind of uh, really uniquely special opportunity but you know it didn't go the way we wanted it to I think I think, I think it, 
the, the love affair the fans had with ECW and me being one of them, just, just with the, to experience that and then to try to recreate it. It's that old phrase, you can't get, go home again. And, and it's true. You can't. So we, we tried, uh, to stay true, true to the spirit of it. And I think the original ECW guys got it. The, the ones like that, that were put in to fill in the blanks. Uh, I don't think that it mattered much to them or they understood the concept of what ECW really was about. Um, we tried, but when you get booked into towns that are college towns in the summer, it's hard to really to draw fans because there's nobody there. And then to blame us for it, you know, with a limited roster as far as actual manpower, limited television, and, you know, rather shady writing and booking that goes against the conceptualization of ECW. It was doomed from the beginning, and I think we knew it right away. And if we didn't know it right away, we certainly realized it when both Sabu and Rob Van Dam got busted for smoking weed. <laughs> <laughs> now that night, in and of itself, is crazy for me. My traveling partner at that time was Mike Knox, uh, because he was living in Atlanta, and I was living in Atlanta at the time. And so I didn't travel with Guido. I traveled with Mikey Knox, and uh, we became good friends and traveled, uh, you know, and he had to deal with me being, as he used to call me, uh, Edgy Wop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I traveled with uh, the, the kid from the Ascension, uh, O'Reilly, I think it is. Yeah, O'Reilly was in the, that crew. Ryan O'Reilly? And a guy named Derek Nykirk. He's the bigger Ascension guy. Oh. I think, so we all travel together, but at this time, uh, O'Reilly and Nightcork were on the road. It was just me and Knight and Mikey, and we were traveling to Philadelphia from the house show that we had. And we were, and I, for whatever reason, I just made a point to drive 55 miles an hour. And this was the same road where everybody got busted for, <laughs> for speeding and whatever. And while we're driving, I saw this truck turns over right behind us and he's flying up the road actually he's going faster than I'm driving on the side of his door it was the craziest thing i ever seen in my life I pulled over me and I, Mike helped everybody out and the guy was trapped in his truck and knocked the car over into the woods the girl's face was all cut up and one, and the worst part about it is the guy got hit and was on a motorcycle so nobody can find the body anywhere you can't find this motorcycle where's the, you see the motorcycle is destroyed and there's nobody around. So where's the guy? You know, and we're all, you know. And sure enough, the kid is sitting on the back of some bumper without a scratch on him. <laughs> the craziest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> what happened is the guy in the truck was drunk and he was speeding and he wanted to help. He wanted me to get him out of his truck so he could go to his friend's house and he could, he could kayfabe the accident. <laughs> <laughs> He was trying to run a deal. He was trying to make a deal with me. Hey, get me out of here and I'll hook you up. With what? You're stuck upside down in your own truck. Where do you want me to hook you up? You're going to hook me up with what? <laughs> oh my God. That was the craziest thing. And then sure enough, we get to Philadelphia. We're like, all right, we're going to make our big, you know, we're going to have our first reel and blah, 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 and Rob Van Dam. And we're going to turn this ship around. And oh, we got arrested. <laughs> wow. That's when ECW was truly dead for the second time. <laughs> so, um, you've worked at CZW, and to, to me, like, I feel like being in that Philly area and the, the way that they run, like, that, I feel like that's the closest thing that I've seen to ECW since it's shut down. Like, what was your take at CZW when you worked there? Um, I, I loved it. I really, actually, I really did. Um, I enjoyed it, I think, in some ways more than Ring of Honor. Uh, and in some ways I enjoyed Ring of Honor more. I was actually doing both uh, at the time. Um, I think, I, you know, guys, you know, I, I became good friends with Trent Acid. Uh, and uh, boy, isn't that sad. Mm -hmm. I miss my friend. Um, and so I enjoyed hanging out with those guys and, and B-Boy, <laughs> uh, talented guy. Uh, I just, I enjoyed, I enjoyed CZW, uh, Ruckus was great, um, 
you know, it's a lot of talented young guys. They needed to be taught a little bit. I got to work with Ruckus a few times. I taught him a lot about how to make all that stuff that did make sense. If I could have worked more with him, I think we could have even done, even become more well-rounded. Um, because, you know, the thing was, I was never a really great athlete. Uh, but I always tried to maximize the guy that I was wrestling with in a way that helped me wrestle the match that made more sense. So if you flew, I would catch you and take you down. And if I had to fly, you were going to do vice versa. But, you know, was, I, I, I would say that of all the indie groups I ever wrestled in, uh, when I was in CZW, that would be one of my favorites. Wild Side would be up there as well uh, with Bill Barons, but I enjoyed that a lot. Ring of Honor, of course, but I don't even consider them an indie group anymore. They might have been considered that when I was there, but you know, CZW is a lot of fun. You know, I, I don't know necessarily about how it's run today. I haven't really watched too much of their product, um, but I, I enjoyed my time when I was there way back when. Nice. So now, in your opinion, Alex, who's the greatest Italian wrestler of all time? <laughs> well, uh, I guess you have to say Bruno San Martino. Yeah, I was thinking that. <laughs> <I mean, laughs> you know, the guy was a champion for seven years. <laughs> yeah. How how over are you when you have been the champion so long that you literally say, I just, I don't want to be champion anymore. <laughs> I don't really, I really, I'll, you know what, I'll wait a couple, I'll take it back later, but right now I need to, you know, I want to go home. <laughs> he was the champion for so long that they just, they never were, I don't think he ever would have lost until after Vince Senior passes away. <laughs> You know, I mean, Bob Backlund notwithstanding, no, no, no offense to Mr. Backlund, which, by the way, it, can I tell you a Bob Backlund story? Yeah, sure. Well, what is that? So, it was, talk about a crazy time in wrestling. WCW was going through all their pitfalls, and, and no one was dealing with more pitfalls than, than uh, Scott Hall. So, Scott Hall was friends with... Uh, just incredible, as you know, or maybe you don't. But anyway, they were friends from their WWF time together, and I guess PJ was a quasi member of the Click. So he, Scott Hall, had been either fired or released or quit from WCW, and he was in between companies, and he wanted to come and uh, come to a show uh, and, and wrestle ECW. Okay, so we're in the. Uh, the Mid Hudson Civic Center, I believe, in uh, upstate New York. Yeah, I think Poughkeepsie, I think that's where that building is. So we're at this show, and Scott Hall is there, which in and of itself is just surreal considering that he's Scott Hall and this is ECW. How did this ever happen? And then out of nowhere, Bob Backlund comes to the back. <laughs> now, what's great about it is Guido is the biggest, like, he was a huge Bob Backlund fan. So he had to go meet Bob Backlund. I mean, hell, it's Bob Backlund, you know? I mean, Bob Backlund of my generation was the guy that came back and went kind of psychotic and was talking about plebeians and all this other stuff that wasn't getting over. So, whatever. It's all good because he's still Bob Backlund. So it's cool that Bob Backlund is in the, in the house. And at this particular time, I think Mr. Backlund was trying to run for office or something like public office and okay and uh so he's in the back and he's talking you could just feel that something's slightly off with it just by you know like the character uh, you saw on tv okay well uh you know it's bob backland and he's just you know he's being he's the character and then he comes to the back and he's bob backland and he's the guy from when i was in eighth grade. I mean, what the hell is going on? Why is Bob Backlund so weird? But whatever, you know, hey, I mean, at this point, I don't know what the hell is going on. I went from working at McDonald's to being at WCW to being at ECW after that, and now I'm looking at Bob Backlund talking crazy talk to Guido. I mean, what the hell is going on? So, Bob Backlund wanted to run an angle uh, on the show, and he asked Paul Heyman to do it. He said, well, can I run an angle on the show? And 
and Paul was was producing television at this show, and, and he, he kindly uh, declined to, you know, to work at angles that would tell Paul Bob Backlund to <laughs> run for office. Okay. So Bob Backlund leaves, and then we go on with the show. And at some point, at some point, Bob Backlund had, 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 gone into business for himself and ran the ankle during the TV taping. <laughs> he tries to get into a fight or some kind of convoluted mess with a security guard and and, and, and gets himself literally we kicked Bob Backlund out of the building. <laughs> oh my god. Oh man. <laughs> because Bob Backlund was trying to run his own angle on a show for a company he didn't actually work for for a business he wasn't actually trying to sell. Oh, so if you look at it from the standpoint of absolutely insane, I think that he literally at some point really went really off the rails crazy. <laughs> And now he's carrying around him, that, that kid on TV. What's his name? Darren Young. Darren Young. The new Bob Backlund. The guy is amazing. Like, it's just. This is the former. This is the guy that lost the belt before Hogan won the belt. Like, he, the Iron Sheik, Iron Sheik, notwithstanding. But he was effectively the guy that handed the keys over to Hulk Hogan. And now this guy is being kicked out of the ECW show. I mean, what are we talking about? <laughs> uh, it's not a gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's for real. I think, I, I think it was so hard for me to understand that Bob Backlund really is really crazy. That I, I really thought that wrestling was fake. Like, <laughs> apparently, I was nobody really ever did spark me up, at least not until I got into the business a little bit more. But I really thought that was one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced. That Bob Backlund got kicked out of the building. Wow. I remember Guido being completely confused about what conversation he should have with Bob Backlund. Like, it's like I wanted to meet this guy so bad, and then I don't know what to say. I don't know what we were just talking about. <laughs> it's funny because I I ran into him at the uh, big event, and uh, uh-huh. like he grabbed me too, and I just want I wanted to ask him like a question, and he just like went off and like I don't even know what we're talking about, and like he grabbed me by like the neck. Oh my god! Yeah, he, he was so funny. Like I I've heard stories about him being like a little. That's a man. He, he's a character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I wow. Yeah. And he's not even from the drug era. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't even know. Like all the guys in my generation, I, well, you know, yeah. was just part of the business. But he's from the generation, the bygone generation, bygone generation. And you know, you know what? What the hell happened to Bob Backlund? <laughs> it was just such a weird business, man. It really, it's just so weird, Andrew. I swear, it's just the strangest, like, just everything you know about making money, you cannot apply to a business that's trying to make money. I mean, it, it, wrestling, I, I don't know. I don't understand any of it anymore. I don't think I ever learned anything that I, as far as how the business makes money, I just don't, I don't see it. It's just it's so crazy. So many crazy people running it. I don't know how they make any money. So, back in back in uh, two thousand six, uh, the December to December uh, pay per view. Can you talk oh, about? <laughs> did you know going into that that it would be like you know like a cult classic and maybe Paul Heyman in his last appearance for a while? I mean, I think we sold five thousand tickets to a building that sat twelve thousand people. In a show where we highlighted two matches, and I mean, if you, I mean, from the standpoint of where the FBI was, I mean, the FBI was dead in the water when it comes to that. When ECW was running a show, when they were going to Italy, and they didn't bring us to the show. I mean, we, <laughs> buddy, that's our, that's our, those are our people. Yeah, and you, you, you get the soft. The European tour? We can't go to Italy? Yeah. It's the FBI. So we knew the FBI was dead in the water. I, I mean, especially Tony Mamaluke. I knew, I knew, I mean, my character was, I mean, they didn't have anything for me. They didn't know what to do with me. They already had Guido, and at least they liked him. I, I came in on a, a dead brand with a dead gimmick, as far as they're concerned, and a dead angle going nowhere. They brought us in, and they gave us uh, Trinity, who 
for all intents and purposes, looked really good standing still. And I'll just leave it at that. And <laughs> from there, we were on the, I mean, God almighty, it was a disaster. It was a disaster. And the fact that we were only barely two hours long, why would you pay 50 or 60 bucks to watch a show for less than three hours, or at least two hours and 45 minutes? We didn't give the, the fans anything in the arena to see. We didn't give any of the fans anything to watch on television. It was just awful. Uh, it was terrible. I mean, I was in a I was in a squash match on a pay per view against a tag team that wasn't any good. I mean, that tells you what I think about where an FBI was. I mean, forget about it. We, the company, the group itself, had already we knew we were dead in the water. Uh, and eventually, guys like you know would be exposed for what they really were. And as far as what made ECW great, is the same thing that brought ECW down. The talent and their propensity for random violence led to poor, which effectively means that you have a locker room full, full of poor decision makers. That's what was entertaining about it. <laughs> so eventually that doesn't translate to a, a, a publicly traded company. The December news, I mean, I was on the worst pay-per-view in the history of wrestling. And I was on the worst match, the worst pay-per-view of all time. The only thing worse than that was when Stupid Vince Russo had me tarred and feathered for Monday Nitro. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I tell you what, if I had one match left in me, it would be Vince Russo and I would give all my winnings to his family because somebody's got to bury him. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jim Cornette would love to team up with you. <laughs> oh, Jim Cornette, you know what? If I would just love to see them slap fight each other until somebody gave up my life. Did you see he put out the warrant? I hope I don't get a. I hope I don't get a. a what is, uh, a, an order of protection against yeah, me because yeah, 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 yeah. I actually live somewhat near that club. Well, not anymore. I guess he lives in. Where does he live in? Uh, Indiana now. Yeah. The hotbed of wrestling, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, um, my my last question for you. Uh, basically, you have wrestled for pay-per-view, on pay-per-view, for just about every major company there was. Uh, you won tag champions for ROH, ECW. Um, what was your favorite moment out of your, you know, decade-long career? My favorite moment in my career? Gosh. Um, I'll tell you what the coolest moment was. It was, uh, Right after, right after our WCW tryout match, it was a really, like, the mistakes that we had made in the first match, and we had never wrestled in front of a crowd that big, uh, and we got a, sec a second chance to do it, and actually it was a better match, uh, and my friend Jamie, and, and Jeremy, and Jet Jaguar, and even Molly Holly, we all got our jobs on the same day. You know, that we all got offered contracts the same day. And we got back through the curtain, and a guy that I'd never met before, Perry Saturn, comes up to us and said, that was a great match. I just went in, and he was talking directly to me. I just went in, and I told uh, Eric Bischoff that he needed to hire these kids. Oh, and I'm sitting there thinking, how cool is that? And Steven Regal came up, and he, he gave us great praise. Uh, guys that were tremendous talents telling me personally that we just had a great match and and that you know we deserve a job with world championship wrestling and as they're saying that I'll never forget this moment I'm just, where I was standing was directly across from Eric Bischoff's office he walks out of his office he walks directly up to me he reaches out his hand and says welcome to the company Wow. And that was the coolest moment of my career. Yeah, that is awesome. I'm 22 years old. I didn't have a job. My my car was broken down. <laughs> I was struggling in the wrestling business. I was struggling in life. And then I just got a job with the, arguably the biggest wrestling company in the world. Because at that point, they were still really hanging in there with WWE. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, it was totally cool. It was a, you know, winning the titles was great. Uh, but you know that's just 
that that's 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 just something that you know as, as Malenko told me a long time ago when I said, "Wow, you're the number one wrestler in the whole wide world." That's what PWI says. So living here in the U.S. champion, and he goes, "Yeah, it's a prop. None of this really matters." And I told him it's rigged, and I said, "Oh God, wrestling isn't rigged." <laughs> <laughs> that's when I got sparked up. Dean Malenko did a million things for me, no. uh, and he just turned fifty-six the other day, uh, uh, last week. And uh, he's still my hero, and to get trained by him, and to hang out, and to live with Luna and Dave, who, you know, Luna taught me so much about wrestling, and, and Gangrel, he taught me so much about wrestling, and they took me to ECW shows, and, and, and showed me what this business really was like, and they taught me so many things about how to survive in wrestling, and to be trained by my idol, and to be wrestling and my favorite company all before I was 23 years old. I mean, it was the craziest time of my life. It was unbelievable. It was amazing. Nice. And then I get to tag with Quido and all these years we're still, we're still the FBI. I mean, I've, I've had a unique experience uh, to say the least. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Now, Tony, can you, um, can you tell our fans like where they can follow you and find you on social media? You can't because I don't. So <laughs> oh, I man. I can't pay, bro. I, I, I can't pay. You know why? Well, and, and what's funny is now Guido, Guido has an Instagram account. And now he has to, apparently he's, he's Instagramming, you know, all the time now. And he, this is a guy that never had social media. I can't ever call him being on the internet. And now he's got social media. He's got Twitter. He's got uh Instagram, I think he's got a Facebook page, and now I'm the K Favor. <laughs> oh, man. That's funny. Yeah. Well, it, you know, I, I never got into wrestling to be uh, to be a star. I'm a fan, just I'm no different than you guys. I, yeah. I still watch the show when I get a chance. Uh, I'm, a, you know, I, I, I watch it from a different angle now. I, I see it from a different perspective. I want the business to be successful, and I want it to thrive, and I don't think we are right now. And uh, it's not, certainly nothing to do with the talent. I think it's got a lot to do with breaking kayfabe and, uh, and, 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 and causing irreparable harm to the business. And That's why UFC has taken over, because they haven't broken kayfabe yet. Yeah, definitely. Well... You can't follow Tony, but you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at WrestlingIQ101. Uh, you can follow us on WrestlingIQ101.com. You can listen to this great interview, all of our other great interviews. Uh, make sure you check out the B Plus Player Radio Network on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, all those good things. Follow, like, subscribe. Tony, we definitely thank you for all your time, taking the time out, answering all our questions. Yeah, we, we oh, thank you for having me. You have just listened to the Wrestling IQ 101 podcast, powered by B Plus Player Radio.